Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. On behalf of our academic and cultural group, Iraqi Women's Humanity Scholars, I am delighted to introduce a renowned scholar and academic, Dr. Mu'ayya Jadu, Professor of English Language. and currently working at the Department of English Language and Literature, Faculty of Western Languages and Literatures, Karabük University, Turkey. Dr. Muayyad is a mom looking at his 46-page CV, one field lost in the maze of his creative talents and ingenuity. So in addition to his academic uh, work as a university teacher, no, in Iraq, I mean, people know Mu'ayyad very well. Uh, he graduated uh, from the College of Arts, and um, I feel very proud to say that once upon a time, he was my former student at the Department of English College of Arts, University of Baghdad. He got his MA from there and his PhD also from the same college. And um, he worked at the Department of English uh, uh, College of Education for Women. He worked with us for many years. He was one of the most distinguished uh, students and, and uh, uh, staff member, teacher, scholar, everything. So uh, he also worked um, uh, leaving Iraq, you know, and, you know, lots of people left Iraq, unfortunately, in the diaspora. And uh, he worked in Syria. He worked and then he went back to Iraq. He worked in the north of Iraq in more than one university. He chaired departments there in the north of Iraq. And then finally, um, uh, he, he left for Turkey, I think, uh, uh, recently, and he's working there at, at the of knowledge, talented scholar who has excelled, um, as I said, in, in so many fields. So uh, he was worked online for international universities abroad. He, he worked as trainer of teacher trainers at Arizona State University. He is also president of Japan Friendship Association. By the way, he is uh, what is uh, called Japanologist, and a Japanologist means a specialist in the study of Japan and the Japanese. In addition to all this, Dr. Mu'ayyad is uh, a course designer, a composer, an encyclopedist, a guitarist, um, a vocalist, a music theorist, poet, painter, educator, aphorist, um, graphic and the 3D designer, uh, researcher, stage performer, programmer, uh, and so um, um, just to name a few of all his, um, of his, you know, multi-talents, um, so many talents. You are a wonderful person, Dr. Mu'ayyad. We are so proud of you. I mean, uh, I can't really, I just, you, as I said, I mean, his CV is amazing, amazing, amazing. And uh, we are extremely proud of you, proud of knowing you, proud. I'm proud of being once your teacher. I'm proud of being your friend and colleague now. And um, I just really, I just can go on and on and on saying so much about you and you deserve everything I say and more. We are very proud uh, of you, and also we are really very grateful to you for giving us um, this, um, uh, definitely this wonderful uh, lecture, or shall we say presentation on this theme, which is, um, uh, uh, I'm sure this, this, um, uh, this um, presentation titled The uh, Academic Epidemic, um, is um, something that all of us will enjoy very much and benefit from. Thank you again and again. I know we are short of time. I could go on talking about you, but um, everybody is waiting for your presentation. Most welcome and thank you so much again. Uh, thank you very much, Doctor. Thanks a lot for this introduction. And uh, to tell you the truth, I'm the one. I'm the one who should thank you. Uh, I'm just, you know, I'm simply a product of your own courses, uh, of your own um, care of, uh, of everything you have uh, done for me and for all of us and uh, along the years. So uh, I'm, I'm really honored and uh, 
I'm really pleased to be here. And I consider this like a kind of, you know, it's a family. Uh, today's event is a family reunion for me. So thank you very much, doctor. Thanks for everything. Thank you. Um, it is a family reunion. It is. You know how I feel about you. I, I, I feel like you're my son. And I'm really, really, really proud and grateful. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Doctor. And I would also like to thank okay. uh, Dr. Navam uh, uh, and uh, everybody here. So thanks a lot. Well, um, can I share uh, my file? Yes, sure, Doctor. Thank you very much, Dr. Navam. So um, am I doing well here? I've shared the... Uh, Yes, yes. The it's showing on the screen, Dr. Moayed. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. So, um, well, today's um, uh, presentation I'm supposed to deliver is the uh, academic epidemic. And uh, um, I'd like to walk you through the uh, sections of this presentation. It's structured into three parts. And the first, the first part I call origin and outbreak of this epidemic. And then the second part deals with the symptoms of this epidemic. And finally, in the third part, we talk about the vaccine and cure. In other words, how to uh, prevent this uh, epidemic, you know, from outbreaking in the future and also how to uh, stop it now. So these are the, th the three main parts of this uh, presentation. And this presentation and the slide uh, design are both inspired by COVID-19. Uh, so uh, let's start with the first part, which is the outbreak of this uh, academic epidemic. It all started with a game that I call the university ranking game uh, back like um, uh, two to three decades ago. Uh, they were actually uh, publishers, I don't want to name, but, you know, they're well-known, the publishing companies. They are the, uh, the key players in this game. So uh, some publishers, some of these publishers, they began to release lists of top universities in the world based on published research. Now, the idea was to trigger a ranking competition among universities worldwide. So soon the universities around the world, you know, they soon caught up the spark and then they started competing with uh, one another uh, and then publishing and, and pushing their scholars, uh, their faculty members to publish their research. That was of course to raise their rankings among uh, international universities. So uh, we had this phenomenon, which I call publication fever Everybody wanted to publish. And uh, this fever became a money-spinning opportunity for publishers. So many publishers started making money out of this. It, it became a fever. And of course, according to the law of supply and demand, publication fees skyrocketed. And this is very natural because all the uh, teachers around the world wanted to publish more and more research. So now the problem here is that a new era of, um, of ranking universities ushered in. So according to the traditional ranking um, system, the ranking criteria, there were many ranking criteria, including research, but not limited to research. For example, the ranking of a university depended on the teaching quality on scholarship programs, awards, academic achievements, exchange programs, organization, and blah, blah, blah. I know there were many, but including research, of course. But now, for the, for the last two decades, things changed, and the ranking system changed. Today, the ranking of universities depends mainly on research, published research, and citations. And where are the other ranking criteria? They're, they either completely disappeared or were, you know, undermined. So that's the problem. I mean, traditional ranking uh, criteria have been replaced by uh, the, sole, uh, the sole criterion of uh, publications and citations in international journals. 
Some universities try to avoid this and they try to steer away from the game. But, you know, the pressure and the pull were too powerful. So they, you know, soon found themselves uh, drawn and dragged into the, uh, the vortex. Um, now, the UNESCO issued some warnings about this. And it said, uh, it questioned these, uh, you know, this uh, dependence on one criteria in ranking a university. And it said, quote, probably it can do more harm than good. Uh, judging a university by uh, only or solely its publications can do harm more than good. And uh, it even questioned, the UNESCO even questioned this ranking system. Uh, it even said, like, uh, why rank universities in the first place? I mean, every university has its own uh, academic identity. So why are we judging universities by just published research? Of course, what happened was we were back to the old uh, principle of publish or perish as explained by Logan Wilson in his book, The Academic Man. Of course, Wilson in his book predicted this uh, phenomenon. You know, he was mainly talking about isolated cases of universities. He was talking about some universities that uh, urged their uh, faculty members and judged their faculty members by the amount of published research they did. But soon this became a global issue and uh, the, the, the publish or perish principle was applied to all universities and became a, a, a main concern in the academic world. Now, I'd like to borrow uh, a term used in restaurant lingo. The, uh, the term is side work. The term side work refers to, you know, all the additional duties that a waiter or waitress uh, does in addition to their main duty of serving customers. Their main duty is to serve customers, but they have other side duties, which we call side work. Now, if we apply this to, uh, a, to faculty members, we'll find that teachers, university teachers, also have side work, like waiters and waitresses. And I came up here with a list of 18 tasks they are probably not stated in the contract, but uh, in the job description, but they are implicit, you know, there, probably generally categorized as duties. Uh, but they, and you can, probably this is not the entire list. You can, you can help with the task. And, uh, and having a look, I mean, just, just the look of this list makes you wonder how come uh, teachers are still able to keep up a smiling face. And this workload, and because of this heavy workload on the uh, teacher's shoulder, we have a phenomenon which everybody knows as uh, teacher burnout. And there are many gu guides out there in the market helping teachers how to avoid bur teacher burnout. Uh, some of these guys, for example, they say you, you, teachers must uh, improve their time management skills. But the only problem is to improve your time management skills, you, you need time to manage, right? I mean, if you don't have time, how can you manage your time? Uh, that's a, an issue. So soon enough, teachers began to live under the looming shadow of publication. The simple equation here kicks in, which is lack of focus, if you add that up to insufficient time and a lot of workload, the, re the natural and only result would be poor quality research. Now, I'm not, definitely, I'm not undermining teachers as researchers, on the contrary, but this is a simple equation. I mean, if you bring the best researchers in the world, the best, the cream of the crop, and then you ask them to do research, but, but you don't give them uh, enough time, they have limited time, limited resources, and there's a lot of uh, uh, side work, then uh, the natural result is poor research. You never expect good, even if they are the best researchers in the world because time and resources uh, are definitely important in the making of great research. 
Now, when, when quality was sacrificed for quantity because of this publish or perish principle, a lot of poor quality research permeated the academic journals. And this compelled academic institutions, when they found a lot of poor research here and there in academic, uh, uh, dominating uh, academic journals, they came up with the idea of the impact factor as a new criterion for judging research. So uh, everybody now started searching for impact factor journals. It was then when I coined the term impactisis to describe the, um, the over-concern with high impact factor journals. But the problem was even impact factor journals were infected with poor uh, research. And that was also a major global concern. And as I said, uh, the concern with, with, was with quantity rather than quality. Uh, sad to say. Uh, if you have a panoramic look at, uh, and, uh, at the scene and what's going on, you will find that uh, this uh, publish or perish pressure led to poor research at the same time, teachers began to pay more attention to research than to teaching, which led to poor teaching. And with, with poor teaching and poor uh, research, universities, instead of, uh, ironically speaking, instead of getting high uh, in, the, in, the, in, in the academic world and getting high ranking, they started going down uh, and they found themselves going down the ladder uh, of ranking. And this is definitely waste of uh, time, waste of effort, waste of budget. So the, whole, the entire game was going wrong. And you see the vicious circle here of the virus. Uh, we have more concern with research leads to less concern with teaching. Less concern with teaching leads to poor quality teaching, which leads to students with poor standards uh, because they're not taught well. And, but these students now with poor standards are going to be what the uh, scholars of the future, the teachers of the future, they'll, they'll have their university degrees and then go to apply to uh, teaching positions. And then they will also become concerned with, with research. And, you know, it goes on and on like uh, a vicious circle. So where, was, where is this leading us? Uh, we have three crises at the, uh, at the time. We have quality crisis in uh, the academic uh, world and research. We have redundancy crisis because as every, you know, everybody wants to, uh, to publish more and more. Uh, so we have repetitive findings and redundancy in findings, repeated uh, uh, findings in research. And we have the rec replication crisis because some researchers, in order to, to arrive at their findings, they are using resources that are not always available. So they, they, they use uh, resources that expire in time. So by, by the time they publish their research, and then somebody else wants to verify the findings, they can't do that because they cannot replicate the steps simply because the resources are no longer available. And this means that the findings are invalid. Uh, and uh, here in this study called Why Most Published Research Findings Are False, it's because of this problem. It's because of the quality and, and these three crises, and because there is no logic in research. And uh, as the writer says here, quote, there are no relationships among the relationships in this research. So the readers, readers feel lost uh, because there are no logical relationships connecting the different hypotheses uh, because the researcher has not given enough time to the logical content of, of research. And it's uh, also interesting here to say that women in particular suffered more than men in this publish or perish push. And this is because women 
are so much dedicated to their students that you know they they can't find time to to do research because they cannot really leave their students they feel guilty about it so they dedicate they dedicate more than more time to their and another problem that women are uh, are facing uh is, is because they are not receiving enough uh enough citations uh, compared to men uh, so th- this was how it all started now the second part of our uh, presentation is about how can we identify this epidemic in published research or in uh, academic writings so uh, the word academic uh, the dictionary meaning is relating to education and scholarship so when i say academic english or when the term is used you know academic english in fact it's not really just english so what i'm what we're what we're discussing today does not only apply to uh, to english only it applies to uh, you know what's good for the goose is good for the gander so we have academic french we have got academic chinese academic turkish so it's academic principles of writing whatever language is involved and the term academic english is the variety uh, defined as the variety of english that is used in the in academic con- uh, context such as research uh, uh, seminars webinars symposiums etc right well, we should also you know this is a, a just a, a brief reminder that we have three these three terms academic english unacademic english and and non academic english so when you say academic english it means the variety of, of english which is used within the within an academic context and which follows the principles of academic writing and speech the antonym of a- academic english is unacademic english which is the opposite it is also a variety of english which is uh, used within the academic context but instead of following the uh, academic uh, rules of writing uh, it violates these principles not observes them and we have so so these two terms are uh, an, uh, antonyms and we've got the uh, the term non academic english which is also english but it's not used within an academic uh, context and therefore we are not to judge it by uh, the principles of academic uh, uh, writing why you know, i mean you can apply the principles of academic writing to this variety of english but it would be uh, pointless it would because it's irrelevant you cannot judge it uh, it's non academic like for example in conversation when we're having a a, a conversation or when we're chatting um or when we're giving a lecture for example it's uh, it's not academic english it's pedagogical english so when you're writing a uh, an article for a magazine or a journal that is journalese or journalistic english so you cannot really judge it by the academic it's a neutral term there are guides uh, out there in the market on teaching students academic english and for example this is one of them the, Mac, the macmillan this is a, a market leader uh, in the field of academic english um, many universities around the world and this is a best seller so many universities around the world are using the academic uh, uh, macmillan academic writing series so uh, these three volumes for example the first one is subtitled from sentence to paragraph and the second one takes it to the next level from paragraph to essay and the third one from uh, uh essay to uh to research paper uh now as i said i mean this is a very famous guide by macmillan and um uh, it's a market leader in uh education and uh, on their website if you visit their website macmillan tells you something about this series it says that uh, it provides the series provides the fundamental tools required for writing academic context well uh, it sounds good but unfortunately this series which claims to be teaching academic uh, writing in fact it teaches unacademic writing uh, the 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 passages it provides to students which are supposed to be uh, academic 
uh, examples of academic writing, they are entirely unacademic, unfortunately. And this is a, a sample. I just took it from the series and uh, the, it's full of uh, these passages, but this is just uh, one sample about Niagara Falls. So if you uh, take this paragraph, which is supposed to be an example of academic English, you will find, if you read it, you will find that this paragraph, you would give it 19 strikes for being unacademic. I'm highlighting some of these strikes here. Notice these words, for example, in the paragraph, uh, in this paragraph, popular, beautiful, power, the power of nature. It says the power of nature, unforgettable, amazed. Now, these are like viruses in this passage. Why? Because they violate the principle of measurability in research, in academic. It's one of the academic principles. You, you should never use terms which are immeasurable. The terms we use in research should be measurable. How can you measure the power of nature? Now, what is power of nature? We don't have a device that measures popularity or beauty. Amazed, you know, th this are, these are... Uh, not words that you used in academic writing. More strikes here, for example, thousands, fast moving, loud roar, close up, cool, near enough, near enough. What's near enough? I mean, th these, these words, they violate, again, they are just like viruses in this passage and they, they violate the principle of precision. So they are imprecise instead of being precise. Close enough. How close? Near enough. How near? Fast. How fast? Uh, loud roar. Uh, how loud? I mean, we have to be uh, precise about this. Precision is just like accuracy. Uh, but, you know, there's a difference between precision and accuracy. But they are both principles of academic writing, which are never found in this passage they're just uh, violated in this uh, paragraph more strikes and this time for what this time for uh, objectivity it, this paragraph violates the principle of uh, of objectivity it makes use of words like you feel you you know feel uh, objectivity is, is one of the principles of academic writing which we don't find in this paragraph one more strike my go here and we never use the imperative mood in research, not allowed. In scientific research, we don't do that. Uh, one more, so now we're up to uh, 19 and we can crank the number up to 20, which is what? Which is lack of citation. Their paragraph is full of assumptions. There's no supporting evidence. Nothing is cited, no reference is cited. Uh, and that's another strike. In scientific research, we must have documented evidence. Probably one more strike, which is the use of abbreviations in academic. We, abbreviations are not to be used in academic writing. So that's uh, 21 strikes. So, you know, in one paragraph I sampled out from this series, just one paragraph, uh, the word count uh, is 117 words, but how many strikes? 21 strikes, right? So where's, what's, it makes you wonder, it's, okay, well, what's academic about this paragraph? It's not, this, this paragraph is highly infected text, okay? And it needs to be rewritten, you know, uh, following the uh, real principles of academic writing. Remember, we were talking about Macmillan here, which we described as the bestseller and the market leader. Uh, so the, the, the question is, is this contagious? Yeah, sure. Because it's a bestseller, there are many students out there using this. Universities are teaching this course. So uh, no wonder that our students' papers, yeah, and assignments, and, uh, and theses and dissertations are full of fallacies, logical fallacies, and, uh, or, and violations of academic uh, principles of writing. Now, one of the typical examples, you know, one of the typical paragraphs I often encounter in theses and dissertations is this uh, paragraph where, where you find the first 
sentence and the last sentence are both academic, fine, you say, okay, these two sentences, they follow the academic principles of writing, but then sandwiched in between, you find different types of sentences that violate uh, the academic principles of writing, ranging from uh, uh, you know, pedagogical style, journalistic style, you know, even conversational style. So that was the second part, the symptoms. Now we come to the third and last part, which is the vaccine and cure. So what are you gonna do about it? How can we stop this uh, epidemic from spreading? And how can we uh, prevent its, um, its occurrence in the future? Here, I'm going to draw from my own experience as to how to stop it. So these are things that I did along the way in order to prevent this from spreading out any further. I suggest that we introduce courses in all departments, not just in the English department, but other departments as well, uh, a course on logic. A course on logic. Courses on logic are very important for students because I believe that, student, that before students uh, learn how to write, they should learn how to think. And uh, a course on logic would train students how to think. It's very important to learn how to think logically and academically. I consider logic as the DNA of academic English. Take logic away and you're left with just an aggregate of uh, pointless, meaningless and purposeless words. Another way to uh, resolve this issue is to introduce your students to dictionaries of fallacies. And they're going to enjoy these dictionaries uh, because these dictionaries will be very important uh, in, in detecting, identifying fallacies, fallacious arguments, not just in, you know, in their uh, assignments and then the research work, but even in their everyday life. The third book here on this slide, for example, is subtitled, half-truths that are ruining your life. So it's not just about uh, research, it's about a student's everyday life, you know. We should train students how to identify and detect assumptions and classify assumptions in terms of cogency and expression into closed world and open world assumptions and tacit and explicit assumptions. So, for example, we can teach students like, we can give them a sentence, like this simple sentence over here. Shakespeare was one of the greatest dramatists and poets of the English Renaissance. We tell the students, like, look at this sentence and identify all the assumptions in this sentence. Now, simple as it looks, the sentence contains 15 assumptions. The students should take these assumptions one by one, classify them, verify them, and uh, evaluate them, and finally decide to either keep them in the sentence or eliminate them. And to eliminate these uh, or one or more assumptions here, they have to restructure the sentence. So again, they have to go through this process and uh, uh, I call this the four-layer logic mask. Uh, the uh, students should run these assumptions in this sentence through four filters. Uh, first, they have to identify the assumptions, if there are any. And of course, every sentence contains assumptions. And then classify these assumptions into uh, in terms of cogency and in terms of expression. And then they verify these assumptions through uh, supported evidence. Uh, and those that are unverifiable, <clears throat> they can't find evidence for them. They simply eliminate them from the sentence, which means they have to restructure the sentence, rephrase it. And probably, you know, after all this process, which takes a lot of time, uh, uh, they, they, they'll they just uh, uh, decide not to include the sentence in their research paper, simply because we have another problem, the use of the word greatest, and great, again, is an immeasurable word. It violates another principle 
uh, of uh, academic writing. So they're going to discard this uh, uh, sentence. Uh, another solution to this problem is introducing a new academic title in universities, which is the researcher. Now, faculty members are all teachers, but we should also have researchers as faculty members. Uh, the university I'm currently working in has this academic title. So uh, there are uh, employees who belong to, the, uh, to, to faculty. They are faculty members, but they are not teachers. They are researchers. And uh, their job is just to do research. And uh, it depends on the policy of the university. For example, some universities require that they do at least a minimum of four uh, research projects. They should complete four research projects a year. They are dedicated to research. They don't teach. You know, they just do research. And that's why, because they have a lot of time, a lot of resources, no pressure grading and teaching and course design and dealing with students there's all, all that pressure is, is absent and that's why the research they come up with is good uh, research because you know they have time they have resources they they're dedicated to it there's no pressure on them they don't teach and uh, this is at the same time this is going to reduce the burden on teachers and there'll be less burnout, less teacher burnout, uh, and improve teaching standards, boost teaching standards. Another solution to this problem is launch projects for students. The, this project I launched, which I call KEEP for students, I encourage students to write and publish academic articles and academic uh, essays. And it depends on peer review, these articles, like uh, students writing articles and giving them to other students to evaluate. So this is another way of fixing this issue. In also encouraging students to write and publish academic guides for other students. This is another attempt to uh, introduce fallacy finding assignments, inserting it within the course, uh, making it part of the course assessment tools. So, for example, this assignment requires students to, to select a, a Scopus journal article and then try to find, try to identify all the fallacies in that article. Try to, you know, it's a challenge, of course, but it's a challenge worth taking. And uh, it, it's going to train them on how to think logically. Uh, awarding certificates to high achievers is another, like, in, th this provides motivation and encouragement to uh, students. I also asked students to volunteer, so it's for free, to volunteer in the department to work as TAs or as researchers in the department, like for one year. Aziz here is one of my students who did that. Asking students to volunteer as um, librarians in the department when teachers want to, to do some research, uh, a student can help them out locating references. So you give the student a, um, a topic and he or she is going to compile a bibliography for you. And this is going to save a lot of your time. And at the same time, the student will benefit a lot because he or she is going to learn how to uh, search and locate sources in the library and uh, they are also going to archive. Encouraging students to make academic speeches. Chiro here, one of my students, for example, is very much interested in making academic uh, speeches uh, in the field of feminism. And uh, also introducing the bonus point policy, which I inserted in, my, in every syllabus I have. Students who do some ex uh, extracurricular uh, projects, they get bonus points for it, and these bonus points will be added to their final. Asking students to contribute articles to Wikipedia uh, is also one step of encouraging their academic uh, abilities or skills. Asking students to write academic reports on uh, university events, and they're going to learn and have fun at the same time. 
amazed me that some students started not only excelling in research and boosting their improving their skills in uh, in uh, research but also started inventing new genres in literature so rose for example here uh, she tried to invent this emoticonic lyric a new genre in poetry and sarah here she invented the hexaplot narrative which is six narratives embedded in in one uh, literary work, uh, also a big challenge for her, but she managed to uh, to write a, a hexaplot narrative. Another problem we face is the genetically, what I call genetically engineered text. Uh, genetic, genetically engineered text is when students take a text and run it uh, or, or temper with it, temper with its logic. So they try to rephrase sentences and, and they mostly depend on, uh, of course, we have similarity rate uh, generators. I use Turnitin and Authenticate uh, to uh, un identify similarity rate and detect plagiarism. But these programs are not enough, actually. Why? Because students are now using, today they are using article spinners. Now, an article spinner, you upload an article to to the program to the app and then the the program is going to rephrase the the sentences and paragraphs to change it for to make changes to it so it's it's going to have the same idea they claim that they are going to introduce the same idea but a different phrasing and wording so it's a it's a, like a rephraser a rewriter of articles the problem here is that when you rephrase an article or reword it uh, these assumptions will change. These assumptions in the background of the sentence, they're going to change. You see, rephrasing any article can affect meaning, and therefore it's going to impair the logical content of the text. I remember George Carlin, he said, you know, you often hear that, uh, quote, you often hear that in the classroom or uh, the courtroom. They'll say to you, tell us in your own words. So he says, do you have your own words? Hey, I'm using the ones everybody else is using. I often give this classic example to my students, like how by changing the position of the word only, you're going to change the entire meaning of this sentence. So restructuring a text definitely is going to affect meaning. And because students are using article spinners, so uh, Authenticate and uh, Turnitin are not really uh, enough uh, because Authenticate and Turnitin, they just uh, they check similarity rates, but they don't check if uh, an article has been spun. In that case, we need new apps such as this one, Spin Me Not, which detects spun text. So this is the, uh, the job of such apps. And in conclusion, uh, I'd like to wrap up this presentation with the notion that there is still time, in fact, to stop this academic epidemic before it develops into a pandemic. And um, I mean, you should know this fact that medical research comprises 44% of all research conducted worldwide. And that's a, and that, that's a high rate, high percentage. So it means that can, uh, the, the misuse of academic English can, in fact, it's not just an academic concern, it's also a health concern. And here's an interesting study, a study conducted in uh, 2013 in the United States. It shows how references to strong addiction causing drugs, drugs which cause addiction are simply referred to as painkillers. And this encouraged patients to uh, use them, and also it encouraged doctors to prescribe them. It shows that the terminology used by the World Health Organization and the American Psychiatric uh, Association have lexical gaps. And these lexical gaps can be manipulated in clinical trials and investigations. For example, instead of calling a case addiction, they call it misuse and, or abuse 
or dependence on drugs. So in other words, they are euphemizing these drugs, belittling the situation or the case. In 2010 alone, according to this study, 2 million Americans suffered because of this inaccurate use of the English language. This shows you how language can really put your life on the line in danger. Another study, another interesting study, you now using Warren's euphemism model and Lakoff and uh, Johnson's metaphor theory, this study was conducted in Jordan and it examined the terminology used to refer to COVID-19 in pandemic discourse. You see, in some countries, the virus is dysphemized, made to look scary. While in other countries, the virus is euphemized. This is the opposite. There it was in some countries, it's dysphemized. In other countries, it's euphemized, made to seem less harmful. In fact, uh, in, so in these countries where the virus is euphemized, there is even a, den a popular denial of its existence. So many people today, they think that uh, coronavirus is a hoax, is a joke. It doesn't even exist. Right. So the, the study, of course, is a descriptive study. So it's limited to identifying the euphemistic and dysphemistic use of uh, uh, or representation of the virus. But the researchers recommend further research to be conducted in the field to identify the factors, probably sociopolitical factors behind this euphemistic and dysphemistic representation of the virus. Uh, another term is the difference between epidemic and pandemic. So before March 11, 2020, coronavirus was considered an epidemic. It was only on this date that WHO decided to call it a pandemic, which was when all the precautions started to be taken seriously. Now, one of the issues here is if WHO declared it as uh, a pandemic and not an epidemic, then things would have been completely different. People would have been more careful, probably. It wouldn't have spread that much, and uh, there would be less lives lost. So again, it's a terminology game, right? And the lack of accurate data also contributed to this delay in its declaration. And remember, please, that all this has zero budget. I mean, all these projects, all these uh, solutions will not cost a penny uh, because they're all volunteer work. Uh, so uh, we're going to do a lot for free. That would be really uh, interesting. If we really do that, definitely we will be guiding our students in the future to produce like healthy and cutting edge research. And this is, again, a link to the 10 principles of academic English. And this is the link to the video. So finally, thank you very much for attending this session. I'm really honored to be here. Uh, you can contact me by Facebook, my webpage, and all these uh, links are here uh, to my YouTube channel, to my website, and to my uh, Facebook. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Mayad. I wonder thank you, if Dr. Dr. Mayad is still with us. I just want to say a few words. Uh, Dr. Mayad, we can't thank you enough for this invaluable, highly informative presentation. I heartily recommend it for all departments of English. And um, I love your use of epidemic vocabulary to describe the problems of using and writing academic. I think uh, we have so many viruses in, um, in uh, departments of English, I mean, in concerning the use of English, real good academic English, and we need a tremendous effort to kind of guide our students uh, to the right path um, in using learning and using English. Um, how lucky your students must be to have you as uh, their teacher, um, and I mean, all your knowledge, uh, all your incredible guidance. That's wonderful. They are really lucky. But 
uh, you know, we are lucky too to have you online and to benefit from your expertise. And um, as you said, you've been so generous offering us uh, uh, advice and help and uh, telling everybody that you are available and that uh, you are ready to help, uh, you know, uh, do what you can. Thank you so much and God bless you, Moayed. God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Doctor. Well, uh, thank you for everything, for, you know, everything you did and for attending and for hosting and for actually countless things thank you very much doctor uh, the honor is all mine indeed thank you very much we are we are honored to um, have you we are honored thank you so much thank you so much i have a comment dr moyed if you allow me uh, yes please doctor yeah regarding uh, the 18 roles that you have counted for a teacher i can yeah. add like <laughs> another dozen to them so to speak yeah. We function as quality assurance officers, we function as tabulators, organizers, um, social counselors, um, what else? Fundraisers. Um, yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah. Budget, like, like we prepare also budgets, we, we, we contribute to action plans, all of these things and many more maybe. Yes, indeed. Yes, I agree. You can probably think of the list as um, it's an infinite list of tasks. Yes. <laughs> it can yes. go on and on. Bet you. Bet you. Yeah, it can, surely. Thank you, everybody. We can call off this uh, session. Thank you for your attendance. Thank you, Dr. Moayed, for all us with this very genuine, brilliant speech. Uh, I myself feel so much inspired. I hope that everybody would reap something from this uh, I'm sure that everybody will reap something from this uh, uh, session. Thank you very much, everybody, and see you in our next webinar, inshallah. See you. Thank you very much. See so thank you to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Dr. Nagam. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, my dear.